Ula Talufa, Tina Kutukatua, Nebo Kilekile, a warm welcome to wherever in the world you are joining us from. My name is Petra Butler, and I am the director of the Institute of Small and Microstates, and my co organizers, Stephen Finizio, partner at Wilma Cutler, Pickering Head and Doer, and Dr. John Pierre Gauci, the Arthur Watt Senior Research Fellow in Public International Law at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, and I are delighted to share with you the fifth annual Small States Conference, which this year will discuss human rights in small states, challenges, resilience, and advocacy, a topic we had decided on at the end of last year, where COVID-19 had not been part of all of our vocabulary, but which has proven a very apt topic. After now nearly living for a year with COVID-19, we all have learned to make the best of the situation, including to meet and to discuss issues dear to our heart online. You will find all the information you need to participate in this conference on the conference agenda webpage hosted on the Wilma Hale website. This includes a link to the conference program, which includes extensive bios of our speakers and chairs and brief abstracts of the issues covered and our conference blog. And you are warmly invited, the link to our conference blog, and you are warmly invited and encouraged to blog. In addition, of course, to asking lots of questions via the chat function. I also would like to take the opportunity to thank Minna Nokola and Oliver White from Wilma Hale and their teams for their extraordinary support to make this conference possible. It definitely takes a village to organize a conference. Now, let us warmly welcome my two guests and keynote speakers, Ms. Margaret McCauley, Commissioner of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, and Ms. Amrana Jalal, Chair of the World Bank Inspection Panel. As alluded to earlier, you have their bios in the program, and you can, you can access via the agenda page. However, I still would like to draw out some highlights. Mrs. McCauley, Margaret McCauley is one of Jamaica's most experienced jurists and a leading human rights advocate. She has long lobbied for and assisted in the formulation and drafting of existing laws and enactment of new legislations to ensure the protection of the human rights of all persons in Jamaica. Mrs. McCauley is currently, as I said, the Commissioner of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in her second term and is a past president. Before becoming a commissioner, she served as a judge of the Inter-American Court for a term, where she contributed for the, uh, to the formulation of the court's rules of procedure. In December 2017, Mrs. McCauley was selected as an honored member of the Gender Justice Legacy Group of notable women's rights advocates who have worked and effected important changes. She was also acknowledged for her work on the elaboration of the rules of procedure and the elements of crimes for the International Criminal Court during the preparatory sessions at the UN headquarters in New York. Our other guest and keynote speaker is Ms. Amrana Jalal. She is the chair, as I said, of the World Bank's inspection, inspection panel, but actually would call Fiji her original home. A gender specialist, lawyer, and development practitioner, Imrana joined the inspection panel uh, in January 2018. Immediately prior to becoming a panel member, Imrana was a principal social development specialist for the Asian Development Bank, as she gained an intimate knowledge of multilateral development bank operations in various sectors. And importantly, Imrana was the first uh, Fijian Human Rights Commissioner. Um, the, at that time, the Fiji Human Rights Commission, well, still is, the first of its kind in the Pacific Island countries. She is the Jurist Commissioner of the Geneva-based International Commission, Commission of Jurists. Um, and uh, she was also the chief technical human rights advisor at the Pacific Regional Rights Research Team office for 15 years. 
She is the author of the Law for Pacific Women, a Legal Rights Handbook, and the architect of the Fiji Family Law Act 2003, and a founding member of the Fiji Women's Rights, Rights Movement. So having these two specialists, it's just an honor to um, talk about austerity, but uh, for the benefit of the audience, I just want to put austerity very briefly into context. In the, dec in the decade since, two since the 2008 global economic crisis, fiscal austerity has become the new normal. In the name of fiscal discipline, governments in more than two thirds of countries throughout the world have enacted drastic austerity measures like severe public expenditure cuts, regressive tax changes, and labor market and pension reforms, effectively disinvesting in human rights. Draconian fiscal adjustments have undermined human rights of all types, from the rights to education, food, health, and housing, to the rights to de decent work, fair wages, and social security, and from freedom of expression to the rights to life and personal security. In the process, these policies have also aggravated disparities such as those of income, gender, race, age, disability, and migration status. So this is just what I just expressed the general view. And especially the general view is that austerity measures in developed countries have generally burdened the poor and disadvantaged while safeguarding the wealth and privileges of the economic elite. My question to my panel is now, is that also true for small states, especially small developing island states, given that many small states are still based on the value of community? And my question is also that in comparison to even New Zealand and many small states, I suspect the difference between rich and poor is not as stark. So there is because of the more community feeling, is that actually has that actually aggravated the disparity? And I would like to ask Imrana to start with that. Okay. Thank you, Petra. And uh Thank you for managing to pull this off despite the pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to participate in this and I congratulate you for, for having this conference today. So let me start out by saying, and I'm aware that you've asked us to speak for two or three minutes, so I will keep an eye on the time. Um, you know, all small island states in the Pacific, and my experience is mainly Pacific, are now fully integrated into the global economy. So they are directly and indirectly affected by global austerity measures, particularly those imposed by developed countries, because we have to remember that many SIDS, especially in the Pacific, are very much donor reliant. And this was obvious during the 2008 global financial crisis. Let's take, for example, a very small vulnerable country like Kiribati. So Kiribati relies on 70% of its food consumption from food imported from abroad. And this is paid for through incomes earned primarily from remittances of Kiribati seamen um, and through fishing license revenues, earnings from the Kiribati Sovereign Wealth Fund, copper exports, and so on. So you can see that these austerity measures cut back their supply for food, raises their prices, and disrupts and reduces foreign exchange income and the country's ability to pay for it causes job losses and incomes, reduction in government revenues, severe cuts in public expenditure, increases in food prices, and so on. So the other countries in the Pacific are equally affected, but to, fair, to varying degrees, depending on the size of their economies and, and, and their level of integration into the global economy. So the impact of COVID-19 is no different, except that this time, it's on a worse scale and unprecedented because there's a combination of a public health crisis combined with country and global lockdowns, which has triggered a global economic crisis, obviously forcing countries to implement austerity measures. So the combined effect has caused catastrophic consequences across the SIDS in terms of job losses, food security, increased poverty and crime, business losses, et cetera, et cetera. 
So one small example in Fiji, for example, COVID-19 has nearly wiped out our tourism industry, which contributes 40% of the GDP. In some countries, it's even more like the Cook Islands. So this has caused a major revenue crisis for the government and has caused over 115,000 job losses in a country of 900,000 people. So over 100,000 families have no income. And of course, we know it affects the rich and poor similarly, but it hits the poor more, of course. And um, I think that sort of goes without saying. And unlike developed countries, the SIDS don't have the economic cushions that countries like Australia and New Zealand has, right? Fiji, for example, has increased its debt level to 100% of the GDP from its financial recovery loans. And at that scale, it's increased its debt. It's not able to, to provide any financial assistance to people who've, who've lost their jobs. And I think I'll stop there because um, I've come to my three minutes. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. And can I just hand over to Margaret? Thank you, Petra. And thank you for the invitation um, to for me to be part a participant in this very, very important discourse. Um, um, I, I am going to sort of um, confine myself to mostly the Caribbean and Latin America, which is uh, our mandate area, our region of um, operations. Um, it, it is what what um, um, Im, Im Rahman has said is true of us as well. Uh, but in in addition, um, the Caribbean islands, for instance, uh, uh, new independent islands. None of us are even a uh, hundred years old as yet in independence. Um, survive at uh, their largest income earner of re uh, revenue is tourism. And um, of course, that is always reliant on, on the global economic situation. But with COVID-19, that has been closed down completely. And uh, um, the effect on the economy of all the islands has been tremendous. Um, in addition to that, we are subject to so many storms, earthquakes, um, which cause in, innumerable damage and, and um, uh, use up a great deal of the resources uh, of, of each country. And of course, the countries also rely on de uh, on on borrowings, and 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 on on um, well the kindness of of neighbours and and larger developed countries in order to survive. What um, has happened um, since there were lockdowns because there were complete lockdowns of islands uh, um, was that business is closed and jobs were lost and because of that the government had to find the wherewithal to give subsidies um, to the earners um, to provide for their families in fact the only um, businesses that were remained open for quite a number of months were supermarkets and um, pharmacies um, so it was it was very very difficult especially on the poor um, markets, the general markets, open air markets, which the poor would normally use, were under great constraint because of the distancing um, which was necessary and, in fact, the lockdowns in homes. Uh, um, so it, it, it has been extremely, extremely very difficult for, for the poor who have been um, made poorer because the country is poorer. For instance, in the last six weeks, we have been having storms every day, every afternoon, thunderstorms, heavy rainfall. And the, the prime minister has been making public statements about the cost of repairs of the roads because craters, the holes which have been made have become craters um, on the roads. and. We are, in fact, expecting another system this weekend uh, um, to, to affect, say, Jamaica very badly and lots of the other islands in the, in the region. In relation to Latin America, 
the, the, the lockdowns and austerity measures and so on have also affected the poor um, and making them much poorer. And in some, not all instances, did they have subsidies in, in Latin American countries. Um, and um, the rural uh, population who could not find the market for their, their uh, vegetables and fruits and so on, um, suffered a double whammy, uh, as it were. And, and um, the government did try to assist the farming population. So um, I think, oh yes, there's also a reliance on transfers of monies from family members working abroad, especially in the US and Canada and UK and Europe and so on. These have been decreased to a very low level, which has also caused family members here to suffer uh, um, a great deal of want. Um, all in all, it is not a, a very bright picture. And we have been told that in the region and understand this, that it would take maybe three to five years to become, uh, to en enjoy a minimum. I think I will stop there because that gives the picture and it's the picture that we want to understand. Great. I would like to jump a little bit more from the economic side. You both of you have, you know, given us a picture of what it's like in the Pacific and the Caribbean to more the political participation and social mobilization. Uh, because the idea or the claim is that that has been hampered or even shut down in the wake of any austerity measures, not necessarily COVID, but we probably have seen an exaggeration of that during COVID. Um, again, my question is, are those claims true in your experiences for small states, either from the Caribbean or Pacific, um, where the community bonds are stronger and one co probably could expect that there is more community discussion so that shutting it down is not so much an issue? And I think we, we keep on with, I'm asking Imrana first and then Margaret uh, yeah. later to... It's a very interesting question, uh, Petra, and I, I thought a lot about it actually. I, you know, this this whole idea that that you know communities are more likely to share and to discuss, and their social safety nets and so on. I think that that traditional system of support and community cohesion is deteriorating. Um, you know, and I mean, you and I have talked about this before. Small countries breed very specific human rights challenges. Social cohesion is important, so people do avoid rocking the boat. You can easily become a social outcast in a country where the community means everything. People are related to each other. If somebody challenges the status quo, it can cause conflict, and conflict causes many social schisms. So it's very difficult sometimes to challenge the status quo to take a human rights stance in a small community. For example, we know that, you know, countries like Samoa, they actively banish people for um, challenging the status quo. So with that sort of threat, it's, it's, it's quite problematic. Um, one thing has definitely happened in some of the larger Pacific Island SIDS um, is the, is the uh, you know, um, uh, um, hankering down on demonstrations or dissent. There's a lot of self-censorship going on. Um, the sort of government line for many small countries is now, we all have to sacrifice human rights. Our priorities are not human rights anymore. Human rights is a luxury. This is not our priority. Our priority is making sure people get three meals to eat um, every day. So those sorts of food and food and um shelter issues have become of higher priority. And one of the things we've seen is in the lockdowns, and you know, granted the Pacific Islands have done very well in, in COVID. They locked down very quickly, and so they prevented COVID from um, entering the country, and there's been virtually no deaths, right? So, but what's happened is that those public order laws, the laws that have been used to, to uh, uh, um, enforced lockdown have been misused. Uh, we also know that there's a lot more so civil society surveillance happening in Pacific Island countries. And there's been one interesting thing which um, 
the human rights organizations in Fiji have attributed to this to the situation, which is that food security has become such a problem and it's created a general atmosphere of hypersensitivity in Fiji, which has led to an interesting religious intolerance. So generally in Fiji, there's religious tolerance between the Christians, Hindus and Muslims. But this Sunday is going to be the Festival of Lights, what we call the Diwali, which many of you will be familiar with, the Hindu Festival of Diwali. Now, Diwali has fallen on a Sunday many times in the past, and nobody has objected to it. There has been a huge furore in the last two weeks where the, some of the more conservative Christian churches have come out and said they object to the Hindus celebrating Diwali on a Sunday because Sunday is the Sabbath, and there should be no lights being displayed, and there should be no fireworks and general general celebration. So... This is an interesting human rights dimension that deserves more study. So, you know, we have all these little anecdotes about things happening, but it's not been possible to do systematic research to, to, um, to document this. Thank you. Uh-oh. You're still muted. Oh, oh, yeah. sorry. I yeah. finished. I finished. I finished. To Petra, did you hear me? Yeah, I heard. No, no, I heard you. But Margaret was mute, muted, so we need. Margaret. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. All good. All good. All good. Uh, Margaret, so you need I to start hope... from from from. Yeah. Yes. I hope Lena has uh, muted me because I don't seem to be able to do it on my system. Yeah. Um. Yes. Um. My. I would say in, in, in relation to this question is that in the Caribbean small islands, um, nations, um, there's a mix. Um, for instance, uh, um, what pertains in Jamaica now is not the same as would occur in St. Kitts and Navis, uh, which are much smaller and smaller population and St. Lucia and so on. And I agree with Emma that the, the bond of communities and within communities is not as strong as it used to be. And the more austerity that is suffered within the countries, the less it becomes, it seems. And in Jamaica, certainly, um, and I, a lot of us have been shocked at the number of crimes were committed during lockdown and, and, and our ongoing COVID um, precautions and um, in within small communities as well. Uh, and uh, people are saying, how can they do that? We're all li liable to be sick and lose our lives. And yet these criminals, <laughs> they've not been convicted yet, but these criminals are, are, are killing people and holding up people and breaking into their homes. And of course, there's the increase in domestic violence activity and the difficulty in accessing protection of the victims, be they um, grow, um, adults or children. And because of lockdowns, offices were closed, the Supreme Court was closed, the courts were closed for quite a while until the, the uh, online systems were set up. Um, this is the problem with smaller countries who do not, where, where they do not have the resources to just in a day or two, set up systems. They have to work out where to get them to set these systems up. And, uh, and um, it, it, we found in some communities in Jamaica that if somebody was out and going to, say, the pharmacy or the supermarket and sneezed, um, some of them were attacked. Now, this normally would not happen when the, the, the bond within communities was strong, but it has, has, there were incidents of this. And in relation to the sharing of food, that we have reports has happened in, in mo most of the islands um, that they will share within, with each other, especially in rural areas, more so than in, in the cities, in the urban areas. 
But in some areas, in urban areas where the very poor live, surprisingly, they are more likely to share what they have. Um, and despite the serious uh, um, uh, want that they live under. Um, I think that the, the civil society here in Jamaica, in the, the coalition of a huge number of them, are actively monitoring every aspect or law imposed in relation to, to COVID. And, and um, in fact, uh, in one instance, there, there, there had to be a, a, a pullback by the government to lessen the, um, the effect of what they were doing. And we've had curfews imposed, um, which were done in, in ways that uh, disadvantaged and discriminated against certain communities. And the reaction of civil society and the public to it caused the government to that and to promise never to do it again. Uh, um, for instance, in the instance of a community, a huge community, waking up of a morning and not being able to leave their homes at all. Whereas in other communities, they were given a, peri uh, a period of notice so that they could go and get their food and, um, and, and medications and so on ready for the lockdown in that particular community. Um, so there, there is that, the voices of civil society are strong, which, is, which makes one feel much better in the circumstances because they're watching that human rights are not trampled on because of COVID, nor is COVID used on ex as an excuse to trample on human rights. I, think I would like, I would like to pick up on the on on that. I um, also, it is great. We have um, just want to uh, kind of make a quick comment on the banishment uh, question. We do have very nice somebody from Samoa who pointed out that not necessarily, and, and I don't think that Imran uh, meant it like that. Um, that the challenge to the status quo is not necessarily a reason to be banished from from the from the community. Definitely not. Uh, but there is, I think, the point is more that there is the remedy or the the, the possibility to banish. Um, uh, and that was more my to my response of saying, you know, there is a strong community feeling. So that was a response to that. But um, Margaret, what you just said actually leads me on to my next question and i think that's a for me a very interesting one because we have seen maybe that not only in small states but definitely as in some of the bigger and more developed states is using talking about we have to talk about COVID 19 but using COVID 19 um to basically have an impact on the rule of law and was that I also mean using the guise of COVID-19 to put through some measures, you know, uh, very quickly, which probably, you know, because parliament might be otherwise, in, uh, you know, has a focus somewhere else. So that's kind of the undermining on the rule of law, not only through the COVID measures, but also using it by putting legislation through that otherwise wouldn't go through. And again, I start, with Imrana just for maybe two, three minutes uh, so that we can get the other questions. Uh, yes, um, certainly. Um, so um, you're absolutely right. Um, COVID lockdowns have been implemented under questionable laws, which are in themselves a breach of human rights. Um, in Fiji, for example, people have been arrested randomly without any clear conditions. Um, etc. Um, there have been many, many instances of police assaults and beatings of citizens for breaching uh, lockdown laws. Um, there has been one uh, major court case that, that went up to the High Court in Fiji, where a group of young men were prosecuted for breaching uh, lockdowns. There was a full court trial. Um, which was eventually, interestingly enough, dismissed by the judge who said 
that the law itself wasn't valid as the government had not properly passed the legislation according to procedure. So the lockdown law was found invalid for process reasons. Another example where the rule of law has been um, under pressure is where uh, a number of unions have challenged the um, their dismissal. And the one that comes to mind immediately is our national airline, Fiji Air Airways. They've um, challenged the dismissal of over 800 staff. And 800 staff and a population of 800, 900,000 is a significant number of people. And um, the argument is, is that people have lost their jobs in a haphazard way. It hasn't been according to what we would see as a, you know, as a specific procedure, uh, uh, um, you know, um, consistent with the rule of law. And that case is pending the courts. It's created a lot of division in the community. Some people have lost their jobs and said, well, why should Fiji Airways get a, you know, get privileges that we don't have? We've all lost our job. We're all in the same situation. Why are they so privileged that they can afford to take this matter to court? Why should they maintain their jobs when we've lost ours? So you can see some of that Pacific sense of cohesion, that social cohesion is not as strong as it used to be. So um, I think I'll stop there with those two specific examples. Thank you. Margaret. Yes. Well, <clears throat> in the, the Caribbean and the information the, the, um, we have uh, about the Latin American countries, um, it's that oversight has been very strong because the Commission has asked all, all civil society organizations to send us information, especially as in relation to the laws passed in all these countries under the guise of necessity because of COVID-19 um, protections. And um, the Commission itself passed two resolutions to deal with the matter, Resolution 1 of 2020 and Resolution 4 of 2020, to remind states of their obligations um, to deal within human rights standards and um, um, instruments. And, and um, that there are no discriminatory le legislation should be effected. And um, as here, for instance, in Jamaica, as I said, civil society has been very active. And um, they, we've had uh, problems when, for instance, when the courts were initially um, closed, um, the uh, civil courts uh, took a while to get into stream, um, but the criminal courts, they tried to keep going. Um, much more, uh, but it was very difficult because at, at for a while they were shut. Um, and then, um, for, in, the, for instance, we found institutions like hospitals sometimes refused to treat um, patients. In a, a notorious example was a pregnant woman um, um, a, about to go into labor, who unfortunately was taken to private hospitals first and refused treatment and then taken to um, a government hospital who refused treatment there anyway eventually um, she received treatment they all suspected didn't know suspected that she she might have been infected with covid and it turned out that she wasn't actually uh, um, and um, she lost her life uh, um, and uh, uh, action has been filed in court um, um, in relation to that. But we, by and large, um, the police have been kept under very strong scrutiny, and they have, and as they are when there's curfew, assisted by the army under the normal regulations that when um, um, the police need assistance, the, the army can do so, but they are under the direction of the police. And I think it's only one instance that was announced uh, in the media wherein they, they, um, a, a, an army person got out of line. Um, so I think it is, as so far has been good, and it has been good in the smaller countries as well, because that's one thing that is easier to be done in smaller countries, I think, um, than, than um, maybe a very large metropolis, uh, metropolitan area. 
uh, and and um, in the rural areas, the police are known personally, so it is easier to identify police officers who misbehave or uh, tend to misbehave. And now, and and access to justice is back to normal, in the sense that. Um, for instance, um, I have to admit, I have a matter in the Supreme Court this afternoon, Petra. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's go, it, it, I was expected to go in person out of the blue. And I wrote to the registrar and said yesterday and said, I cannot. I'm, I'm in lockdown um, because of my health and age situation. And in law, I am supposed to be in lockdown, not to uh, expose myself because of my age and people of my age um, do that. But you can go out for necessities, of course. And um, the registrar has fixed it to be online. Um, so I will disappear for a little bit. So, this <laughs> attend to it. so I think I think by and large, uh, we are not doing too badly in that regard. The rule of law is being respected and it's being respected by the government and parliamentarians when they were the public and civil society feel they've overstepped their bounds. And can I just add one really interesting little kind of trivia is that Trinidad and Tobago went from jury trials to judge only trials to actually try to not have a backlog and get rid of rid of that. So that's that's a quite interesting uh, yeah. development. Yeah. And maybe that also shows that small states have the ability to be a little bit faster in reacting more flexible on the on the on the situation. In um, Jamaica, you can choose to go to judge alone yeah, trial, yeah. but it's your yeah. choice. So, it's, yeah. That's the same in Trinidad and Tobago, but the the possibility even that you could do that, this innovation very quickly done uh, under COVID. Um, we're nearing like the end of our time nearly, unfortunately. Um, so I just would like to ask you in your view, what will be the best way forward for small states to combat the economic effects of COVID-19 and the austerity measures in general? So starting again with um, uh, Imrana. Uh, thank you, Petra. So, you know, um, I think what's happening with the pandemic also is a huge um, opportunity for small island developing states. You know, we're all just too, in the Pacific certainly, we're too economic, economically reliant on, global, on the global economy to meet our requirements for the food. I mean, we, for example, import so much food when we live in a blue economy and we can grow our vegetables and fish to meet our basic needs. I mean, people in the Pacific sell their fresh fish and eat tinned fish. So COVID has brought them to a realization that they can actually save a lot of money by growing their food, fishing, etc. And in Fiji, there's been a proliferation of home gardens. So instead of growing flowers, people are growing basic staples like roro and paji, you know, which are green cabbage, swamp cab cabbage, highly nutritious. So that's been one positive effect of it. But obviously, there has to be fiscal um, support. Organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank that I work for, Asian Development Bank, Global Green Growth Institute, and organizations like this, they need to use this opportunity to help SIDS start a new economy, in a, in a sense, with a green approach. And this is certainly would be aligned with organizations like World Bank, World Bank that are thinking along those lines. So um, oh, another, another very, very quick example that's happened in Fiji is called Barter for a Better Fiji. So whereas some of that old style of bartering has resurfaced again, and it's working really, really well in terms of exchanging food and clothes and so on. So I think that there needs to be a greater emphasis on things like food security, basic human needs, et cetera. But I don't think it can happen at the cost of human rights. So for me, um, if we're going to focus on an economic recovery by excluding human rights, that means that the poor and vulnerable will fall by the wayside. So for me, it has to go hand in hand. It's, we can't separate it. We can't justify the COVID era to sacrifice human rights because the long-term consequences for the rule of law, I think, would be terrible. Thank you. Can I just add, because we got one very brief question from uh, from 
our audience is the, about the judicial remedies. Are there any available, you know, in Fiji uh, if COVID-19 measures violating principles of proportionality and affecting economic and social human rights? And have there been any taken? You, you already alluded to some of the, 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 the one case about the police officers, but uh, does the constitution allow for proportionality analysis? Um, so that, you know, as you know, Petra, our current constitution is one that's been imposed by the military. So remember, unlike other Pacific Island countries, Fiji has a military regime and its government is military backed. Um, so I think you know that although we have a, a cabinet, um, and I'm speaking here as an individual, not on behalf of the World Bank, and I just emphasize that, that, <laughs> that although we have a cabinet, the real authority in Fiji is the military council, which is the real cabinet of Fiji. So th this constitution allows for the suspension of human rights in in uh, in situations of disaster and, and so on and so forth so i can't really see any major challenges to the regime under this dual situation of a pandemic global crisis combined with a military regime so i hope that i don't think i can go any further than that but i hope oh, that, that gives you an idea right. of the context yes thank uh, you Margaret, yes. I think just your view of what will be the best way forward for small states to combat the economic effects of COVID-19 and austerity measures. Yes, uh, um, I think I think we'll have to face the future by, um, first of all, making sure that we have proper um, tax revenues collection systems in place. Most small countries feel they do not have the wherewithal to spend money to set up really effective, efficient systems for tax collection. And little realizing that when their um, tax revenues are insufficient, poverty is increased. The poor become poorer and the rich are not really affected. And they have to ensure that the rich pay the highest level of taxes and go down as a gradient to, to, to the lowest. In lots of these small countries, what it is, is they have a large civil service uh, um, um, force, um, so large that it takes the bulk of, of um, uh, government revenue to pay these, these um, uh, people. And they pay taxes, even but some of them are, are, are very low earners, and yet they pay taxes, but yet very rich do not and can get away with, with tax avoidance and, and tax uh, um, evasion too often. So that's one thing that they have to do. They have to spend the money to get the money in order to provide and meet their, their uh, obligation to have certain um, um, social, civil, and and community uh, um, um, policies and projects in place for the poor, and to ensure that education, health services, and so on, are available housing, uh, are, um, are available to everyone, and and uh, if they have to pass um, austerity um, um, legislation, they have to ensure that one, it is necessary, absolutely necessary, it's proportional, it is um, um, not discriminatory, uh, and, and, and to uh, make sure that the most vulnerable are not the ones most adversely affected um, by it. And, and also, we have to try to get together to deal with the migration issue. That is costing some countries a great deal and others not. Um, there has to be a, 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 a cohesion about how this, this matter is dealt with, both in the Caribbean and in Latin America. It is a very serious question that's affecting the enjoyment of services and, of course, rights. Their rights are so uh, on a uh, very shaky scale too often. First in the country, when they are actually en route, and then in the receptive country where they, they end up. And we have to see that that is not 
um, done because it affects social spend within all the countries that, that are affected um, by migra migratory issue and forced displacement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, this is one of the problems also with online. We, we don't have the opportunity to discuss this for another 15 minutes and then make up the time in a coffee print. Don't, don't do a coffee print. <laughs> so unfortunately, thank you so much. I do would like we got one uh, comment um, from another Pacific Island and that ties in what you just said about migration where you know especially migration workers in that country feel like they can't raise any issues because of their visa status uh, but at the same time saying um, that what the good thing is that there are no flights anymore that people have started because there's no no food coming in uh, well if uh, flights are incredibly reduced that that actually has meant that people starting again growing their own veget vegetables in the ministry of agriculture actually in that country distributed free seedlings to everyone who wanted to plant so there is this positive yeah margaret and imrana Thank you so much for this engaging discussion. Thank you for making the time. Margaret, you got up at five o'clock in the morning. Imrana is talking to us from isolation. So that is, you know, fantastic. And uh, we are all looking forward to seeing you again, hopefully in person in the near future. And all the best and stay safe. Thank you, Petra. Bye. Bye.